Hi and thank you for watching this video. I've been working on several videos over the past few weeks as there are so many things happening around us in the world that would be of interest from a prophetic perspective. But then there is also the urgency of what lies ahead directly before us that we need to consider. So today I would like to talk about something that I think most of us overlook and this involves some details surrounding the resurrection of the dead. If you have watched my series on the rapture in which I have shown how the resurrection of the dead is modeled after the harvest pattern and also after the temple model, you will know that there are three parts consisting of the first fruits, the main harvest and the gleanings. I'm not going to discuss this again in detail today, but suffice to say that when we understand these models, we can see how God's main harvest of souls, those who had faith in Jesus and who are eagerly awaiting His return, are harvested at the start of the tribulation, while the gleanings of this harvest are given over to the poor, or in this case, given over to Satan as a possession. However, when we think about the resurrection of the dead, we normally focus only on what Paul writes, and these are some of the passages in this regard. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Now, I am of the opinion that Paul only gives us a one-sided view of the resurrection from the believer's perspective, and he does not touch on the other aspects that are also mentioned in the Word of God. This is a typical property of the Bible in which we see that information regarding a subject is spread throughout the entire book and requires us to study it in detail in order to piece everything together. For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. In the book of Daniel, we are given additional information regarding the resurrection of the dead, which Jesus confirms in the Gospels, and this is what we read. And at that time shall Michael stand up the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation even to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars for ever and ever. From this passage we are told that the resurrection of the dead will not only include those that will receive glorified bodies, as explained to us in Paul's epistles, but that it will also apply to those that will be resurrected to everlasting contempt. Before we discuss this in a little more detail, let us see what Jesus said about this in John chapter 5. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in the which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice and shall come forth, they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. What stands out for me in these two passages is that this would seem to be describing a single event in which all who are in the graves will be brought back to life when they hear the voice of God or the shout as explained by Paul. One group will receive new glorified bodies while the other will be resurrected to damnation and contempt, whatever that may imply. I believe when we link these passages to what Paul describes, we are better positioned to understand everything that he said, 
and the effect that the voice of God will have on all that are dead at that time. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. When we combine the additional information regarding the resurrection to damnation with what Paul writes, it could give us a somewhat different understanding of what is traditionally understood with the dead in Christ that will rise first. This passage could also mean that those who died without Christ will rise shortly after the dead in Christ are caught up into the clouds with those who were alive and changed into glorified beings. Both groups, however, respond to a single shout from God and include all those who have died and who are in the graves, according to John 5. I believe it is very important to consider the implications that the resurrection to damnation will have on the earth and would need us to address the following questions. Who are those that will be resurrected to damnation and what would we imagine such an event to look like? The position of this event in time is also very important because if this resurrection takes place at the start of the tribulation, the situation on earth during the tribulation will be very different when compared to one in which this resurrection occurs at the end of the tribulation. So who are these people that will be resurrected to damnation? The Bible tells us the following. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. From this passage we are shown God's love for the world and the people in it, and the ultimate price that God paid to redeem the world from condemnation. But it also shows us the reason for people being condemned, and this as a result of not believing the good news of the Bible. From this passage I believe we can know that every person who died without Christ from Adam all the way up to the point where this resurrection event occurs will form part of those that will be resurrected to damnation. The following passage is also written. Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. There are currently more than 7 billion people on earth. How many people do you think lived between Adam's creation and today? Of this number, I think it would be safe to assume that at least 80% would have died without Christ, which means that the resurrection to damnation will certainly include billions of people that will be brought back to life to share the earth and its dwindling resources with those that remain alive. Next, we also have to ask ourselves what the resurrection to damnation will look like, since we are not given much detail regarding this group of people in the Word of God other than their resurrection being mentioned a few times. Would the images that we are shown in the entertainment media of the living dead or that of zombies, not provide matching descriptions of what the resurrection to damnation could involve. This subject has become a major theme in the entertainment media of today, and one has to wonder why, especially when we see how the media is used by our enemy to pre-program and desensitize the population of the world for events that are right before us. It is also very important to understand when this event will take place, as it affects one's view and understanding of the impact and scope of the tribulation. If this resurrection happens at the beginning of the tribulation, it will be far more frightening and problematic for those who are alive on earth and who remain to endure God's judgment over the earth than a situation in which this only occurs at the end. So which is it? 
from a biblical perspective, I always aim to reach an understanding in which I am not contradicting passages in the Word of God, and when we consider the following passages, you will see that this resurrection is associated with the start of Jacob's trouble. Jacob's trouble has to occur during the first half of the tribulation, in order for Israel to be brought to a point where they can call out for and recognize their Messiah, and to subsequently receive his protection in the wilderness during the second half of this period when the remnant will flee Judea. We see this explained to us in Hosea 5. I will go and return to my place, till they acknowledge their offense and seek my face. In their affliction they will seek me early. The time of Israel's affliction is known as Jacob's trouble, and it is logical to understand that Israel's affliction has to precede their rescue out of it, which is followed by their protection in the wilderness, where they will be nourished for three and a half years. This is confirmed for us in Revelation 12, where we see the serpent first persecuting and afflicting the woman that flees, and the woman then receiving protection for 1,260 days in the wilderness. And when the dragon saw that he was cast unto the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place, where she is nourished for a time, and times, and half a time, from the face of the serpent. In Jeremiah 30, we are once again shown how Israel will be saved out of a period that is known as Jacob's trouble. And this would again imply that Jacob's trouble occurs before Israel can be saved from it and enter their protection in the wilderness. For thus saith the Lord, We have heard a voice of trembling, of fear, and not of peace. Ask ye now, and see whether a man doth travail with child. Wherefore do I see every man with his hands on his loins, as a woman in travail, and all faces are turned into paleness? Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. The word of God also shows us that Israel's affliction during Jacob's trouble will be far worse than what the Jews experienced during Hitler's reign. We read the following in Zechariah 13. And it shall come to pass, that in all the land, saith the Lord, two parts therein shall be cut off and die, but the third shall be left therein. So in order for Israel to be saved from their affliction, they have to be afflicted first. And the reason for me making this point is because so many people believe that there will be a false peace on the earth during the first three and a half years of the tribulation. I believe these passages prove otherwise. Only after two-thirds of the nation of Israel have perished will God respond to Israel's cry to save them out of it. And this is certainly not a situation that one would associate with peace on the earth, whatever form it may take. From what I understand, this will happen at the midpoint of the tribulation and will coincide with the last of the remaining Gentiles who have refused to receive the mark of the beast in their bodies being killed and the Antichrist setting himself up in the temple to be worshipped as God at this point. Israel is then saved from further persecution at the midpoint when the remnant flees into the wilderness where they are then nourished by their Messiah whom they will see with their eyes during the second half of this period. And I will bring the third part through the fire, and will refine them as silver is refined, and will try them as gold is tried. They shall call on my name, and I will hear them. I will say, It is my people, and they shall say, The Lord is my God. This same woman who gave birth to the man-child is described to us in Isaiah 26 at the point where she is about to give birth, and this is what we read and notice how the resurrection of the dead is also mentioned in this passage and associated with the birthing process at the start. 
like as a woman with child that draweth near the time of her delivery, is in pain and crieth out in her pangs, so have we been in thy sight, O Lord. We have been with child, we have been in pain, we have, as it were, brought forth wind, we have not wrought any deliverance in the earth, neither of the inhabitants of the world fallen. Thy dead men shall live, together with my dead body shall they arise. Awake and sing, ye that dwell in dust. For the dew is as the dew of herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. Come, my people, enter thou into thy chambers, and shut thy doors about thee. Hide thyself, as it were, for a little moment, until the indignation be overpassed. For behold, the Lord cometh out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth also shall disclose her blood, and shall no more cover her slain. We also have a passage in the book of Revelation that tells us about people who will seek death, but who will be unable to find it. And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months, and their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man. And in those days shall men seek death, and shall not find it, and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. Now if the resurrection to damnation occurs after the tribulation, this passage would contradict that understanding and what we are shown in Isaiah 26 as it would mean that there would be a resurrection event at the end of the tribulation, followed by another five months of torment for those who are no longer covered by the earth, and who were resurrected to damnation, and who are unable to die again. The only option that does not result in a contradiction with the word is to have the resurrection of the dead occur before the end of the tribulation, and it would seem to be associated with the start of Israel's affliction, which is intended to bring them back into a relationship with God. For those who believe that saved believers who had been bought by the blood of Jesus, and who have not soiled their robes of Jesus' righteousness by adding their own filthy works to Jesus' completed work, have to endure the tribulation, please consider this information carefully, and ask yourself whether you would like to share this world with billions of people that will be resurrected to damnation and who will probably be hungry and looking for something to eat. There is nothing that you will be able to do for those who were resurrected to damnation as far as salvation is concerned, and your best hope, should you find yourself in the tribulation, would be to die as a human being without the mark of the beast. If you watched my previous video, you will know that I pointed out how some rabbis in Israel expect their Messiah to be revealed on Purim, what I found very interesting, and also the reason for me posting this video, is this article that I came across in the past week, and the specific timing that is so clearly pointed out in it. And thank you Chris for sharing this with me. Ask yourself this, if Israel keeps a feast during which they celebrate the Jews' victory over the evil Haman, who wanted to exterminate them, how did a zombie walk become a must-do Purim institution? What does the resurrection to damnation have to do with the story of Esther? Could it be that these are more pointers for us to recognize the timing at which Israel's pleasure will be turned into sorrow and fear, and when Jacob's trouble could start with the earth giving birth to her dead? Could it be, and I am only asking the question, that when Israel celebrates Purim this year, the following passage will be fulfilled, and that Israel will be acting out events that will become reality before their eyes. A grievous vision is declared unto me. The treacherous dealer dealeth treacherously, and the spoiler spoileth. Go up, O Elam, besiege, O Media, all the signs thereof have I made to cease. Therefore are my loins filled with pain. Pangs have taken hold upon me as the pangs of a woman that travaileth. I was bowed down at the hearing of it, I was dismayed at the seeing of it. My heart panted, fearfulness affrighted me, the night of my pleasure hath he turned into fear unto me. 
I hope this information, even though some may consider it somewhat controversial, will be useful to you. We who are looking forward to the return of the bridegroom will meet him in the air and will accompany him to the places that he had prepared for us in the Father's house. If we had to wait until after the tribulation to meet him, when would the following passage be fulfilled? Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. May our Heavenly Father bless you and keep you. May He cause His face to shine upon you and give you peace that transcends all understanding as we eagerly await His return. Until next time, or until we meet each other and our bridegroom in the air, God bless.